I titled Standing on the Shoulders of Giants and GNU Radio 4 Usage at, uh, at FAIR, the Facility for Antiprotein Ion Research. We're an accelerator-based particle, particle accelerator-based research facility that operates particle accelerators in order to um, establish fundamental science, uh, to pr provide a research platform for uh, fundamental science down to applied sciences like material science and, um, and biomedical applications, so how to get people to Mars and uh, back uh, alive and healthy. And uh, what's important is what I present here is, is not just my work on my own, but uh, it's always a team. And it's of, um, basically I'm but a dwarf standing on the shoulders of giants. And we're all products of those who came before us and nurtured and guided us. And while we provide uh, a platform for research, um, this is no, uh, we, we, uh, in our facility we have to provide the necessary technology, speak, uh, particle accelerators. But in order to do that, you have to build them. And to build them, you need people. So uh, as mentioned, let's say, also in the first uh, keynote talk, uh, building accelerators about people, developing people, nurturing them, training them how to do. And this is a certain skill set that we have to train every generation over and over again. This is not something to be granted that if you have developed something 10 or 20, 30 years ago, that this is like on for eternity. But you have every time a new generation that you have to train and, yeah, and not just transfer knowledge, but also understanding from one to the next. And uh, yeah, um, and what's very important, okay. Uh, and what's very important that uh, yeah, I, I present this on behalf of many other people, and I'm very thankful for all the people who came before me, notably Eric Blossom, who's the giant maybe here in this image, and then but certainly also Derek and Josh, who are the 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 people sitting on his shoulders, and we would probably, the people who are sitting on your shoulders, because you took us in and adopted us for our application. Um, we're providing a facility, and I thought like before, um, I'm going to a little bit more the meaty, meaty um, nuts and bolts te technical things. I, I thought like I brought like a small introduction video that introduces who we are, what FAIR does, what our mission goal is. And let's hope that this works. Matter, the stuff the world is made of. Matter was created in the universe, but how exactly did it come into being and what are its properties? The FAIR Accelerator Facility in Darmstadt. Here, scientists want to unravel the secrets about the structure and evolution of the universe. Giant planets, stars, and stellar explosions subject matter to extreme conditions such as very high temperatures and pressures, and these extreme conditions can be reproduced at FAIR. FAIR is the universe in the laboratory. FAIR is the only facility of its kind in the world. It consists of a ring accelerator with a circumference of 1,100 meters and a complex system of storage rings and experiments. FAIR will produce beams of ions and antiprotons of the highest quality and intensity. To bring the universe into the laboratory, scientists at FAIR have organized themselves into four experiment collaborations. They want to find answers to questions like, how are heavy chemical elements created in stars and stellar explosions? In what form does matter exist in neutron stars, the extremely compact remnants of supernova explosions? How can antimatter help us understand the mass of matter and the strong force? Which fundamental symmetries define our universe? What are the properties of high-density plasmas that occur in the interiors of large planets? How can we use particles to heal diseases? And how can we protect astronauts against cosmic radiation? Can we use ion beams to change specific properties of materials? The collaborations have developed cutting-edge measurement methods and techniques for their research. They will measure the particle collisions generated by the accelerator using detectors, some of which are as tall as a building. Vast amounts of data will be accumulated during the experiments. This data will be saved and evaluated by one of the most energy-efficient computer centers in the world, a new ultra-high performance computer center called Green IT Cube. The FAIR facility is being built at GSI, the Helmholtz Center for Heavy Ion Research, a world-renowned research institute that has more than 40 years of experience in building and operating accelerators. 
At GSI, scientists have discovered six new chemical elements, for example, and developed a tumor treatment that uses heavy ions. FAIR is being built by an international partnership of nine countries. The biggest contribution is being made by Germany. More than 3,000 scientists from every continent will conduct research here, and they are already preparing the experiments of the future. One of the greatest things of this laboratory is that it is a unique opportunity for learning. So we have people coming from all over the world, from South Africa to Japan, here to learn not only science, but all sorts of different advanced technologies. And for us, this is a fundamental function of our laboratory, that we provide training and opportunities for growth to young people in science and in engineering, and that this then goes back to society at large, and it's our contribution to the future of the world. I think I couldn't have better summarized as our director, Gio Paolo Giubilini. Um, basically, we use a facility, provide the technology and the platform for doing this uh, research. We are based in nearby Frankfurt and uh, Darmstadt and uh, based on an original national laboratory that will be superseded and extended by FAIR. Uh, as you heard, we are like a member organization that comprises of states. So we have 10 member states um, in the recent edition. And uh, we have uh, yeah, the, the primary stakeholders. We have about 3,000 scientists that are currently visiting us on, on site from more than 56 countries. Uh, these are just counting the scientists that are actually on site uh, at one given point of time per year. There are, of course, lots of other institutes that are backing up those scientists and doing the analysis like in the, in the back office or in the, the research institutions. Um, the new fair facility has a construction cost of about r roughly 3 billion euros. This is like in 2005 figures. This is like political speech. So the, the currency was fixed in 2005 and now is uh, es escalated due to price uh, inflation. We plan to do the hardware beam commissioning in 2025 and start operation. And um, yeah, the, the GSI is established already in 1969. And we're responsible for that. You have to learn five new elements in the periodic table. And uh, our annual budget is about 130 million euros. Um, that's the present state of our civil construction efforts. So that's a very huge site, which quadruples the size of GSI. Most of the accelerators are underground, have a total a beam line length of about four and a half to five kilometer length. You see very prominently on the top right, the CIS-100, which is our largest accelerator with 1.1 kilometer circumference. And uh, yeah, this is like a, this is one of the unique things we've built uh, within like a nature reserve. So once we finish construction, everything has to be put back to order as if there wouldn't have been an accelerator in the first place, which is put some challenging constraints in terms of radiation safety and impact on the environment because basically uh, if you camp on site, you should not be exposed to any radiation above the background radiation you have. And uh, that puts very tight constraints. And this is one of the biggest civil construction projects in Europe with about 500,000 or 600,000 cubic meters of concrete being, being used. Just to put this in perspective, that's about a fourth of the Hoover Dam uh, just for, for setting up these tunnels. So it's a very large complex with, uh, with different structures. So yeah, um, what we're trying to do is basically similar to astrophysics or astronomy. We're trying to recreate and understand where is the origin of matter. And rather than pointing our antennas to the sky, we point them towards inside of our accelerators where we have these charged particle beams and uh, where they basically recreate supernovae-like experiments or microscopic black holes, which then decay and where we dis uh, study the, the properties of, of matter on a much higher frequency scale. Because if you look at supernovae, you have one every 50 years. And uh, in high energy physics especially, this, if you measure once, that doesn't count. You have to measure at least a, a couple of trillion times and make sure that always the outcome is the same. Similarly for nuclear physics, where you need like a very high, high brightness and intensity repetition of these experiments to, to look at very, very rare effects. And these very rare effects are not just rare, but also sometimes very faint and hard to detect. So this is like a synoptic view um, built on the existing facility on, on, on the left which comprises of um, a linear accelerator and in the beginning a very powerful particle source that creates these charged particles because that's one of the key ingredients if you want to accelerate particles you first have to strip at least one electron and as soon as you have charged particles then you can accelerate them in an electromagnetic field or static voltage and uh, get like higher, higher powers and what is unique 
of this facility of this extension is that maybe each of the technology on their own exists already but we're supercharging them by expanding the parameters at least a factor 10 to 100 more beyond whatever has been reached nowadays as state of the art and this starts with our uh, yeah our iron sources there basically on a on a uh, on a platform that is electrically isolated and pro provides the highest intensities and then basically being accelerated in a linear accelerator which is rather large so you can sit inside and do like maintenance the reason for that is because you have a very large uh, frequency swing uh, they operate at 108 megahertz some people who do like telecommunication or like radio or tv might wonder like why 108 the thing is there's an airport nearby and 108 is actually where most of the classrooms these days were built for initially to to help uh, planes landing on the on the strip so there's basically like the pilot tone where they land on and when they built this facility, they say like, oh, this, our FM profiles are very cheap to build. Let's build an accelerator around this. And this is maybe also the name of the game. We have lots of RF technologies and synergies with radar applications, vice versa, because we can produce very high, powerful RF waves. But uh, and in need for that equipment that produces this. But at the same time, we build also sources that later on, or techniques that are used in radar applications or sometimes also telecommunications. So this uh, linear accelerator is very versatile, can accelerate basically everything from a proton up to very super heavy elements like uranium and also molecules and uh, notably also not just the, the the primary stable particles but also isotopes of them so we have a garden variety from very light to very heavy and the specialty of our facilities that we can switch between these particles a la carte so you come basically to us and then we can flip out particle species from one day to the next which is also a unique feature and then these particles are further accelerators. In the beginning, you use linear accelerators. Uh, but at a given time, you need so many accelerating cavities that the length of these accelerators would become prohibitively long. So you say, in the end, let's use that one cavity. And because the particle beam is charged, you use like electro uh, electromagnets, like dipole magnets, to bring back the beam to the same cavity. And then every time the beam passes through the cavity, it gets like a small energy boost. And then if you do this often enough, in the SP, in the SIS-18, you do this about 1 million up to 10 million times per second, you get very quickly from a very low energies up to top energies of two, uh, 28 uh, giga electron volt, which is basically the equivalent of 28 billion uh, batteries, uh, AA, AAA batteries put in, in, in line. Um, obviously, okay, that what you can see on this picture in red are the dipole magnets, and, and just behind this, this colleague is uh, one of our RF frequency magnets, which is a bit unique because it generates RF waves in order to accelerate these particles from as low as 100 kilohertz up to 10 megahertz because of the particles that become faster, they traverse the circumference faster, and then we need to follow and have a synchronous frequency tracking of that. What is special about that, that we can do this frequency swing in less than 100 milliseconds and with a precision of roughly 10 to minus 5. So this has very high demands on phase stabilities and, and tracking speeds. And we have to monitor that because if the particles are not synchronously accelerated, they lose them immediately and then they're lost for physics and science uh, and so on. And then in, in yellow, we see some focusing magnets that basically act like lenses. Uh, different to optical lenses, they can focus only in one plane, but if you combine them, you can make the combined lens focus both on horizontal and vertical. And so this causes the particles to transcribe vertical oscillations as they traverse around the circular trajectory. This is very important because this uh, creates also some form of stability, but similar to, like, uh, oscillation, like, also very similar to a string on a violin. This is important because you have self-amplifying instabilities if you don't hit the right tune the particle oscillations become to start to grow and become so large that basically the particles will collide with the vacuum pipe and then being lost. Speaking about vacuum, since we sometimes accelerate partial strip, partially stripped ions, it's very important that these particles are not lo lost due to rest gas interactions. And for this 18, since we're under 100, 800, 100, we have like a residual gas pressure of about 10 to minus 11 millibar. Just to put that perspective, it's a very small number, but this is lower on that scale lower than any vacuum you have on uh, elsewhere on Earth. And in nature, the, probably the only space you will find such a vacuum is on the south pole of the moon when, when it's not illuminated by, by the sun. So it's very low just to make sure that particles stay in the machine and not interact. And also that this theme that most of our diagnostics have to be non-invasive, so we can't uh, touch them because anything, ions a bit like elephants, treat them bad and they will never forget and they're lost uh, before they're being put to good use for science. So yeah, one of the big challenge is that we in total have an, uh, not just one accelerator, but in total 11. 
that have to be synchronized, that we operate with unprecedented machine and beam parameters, and on the 24 7 uh, parallel operations. So we're not just serving one long serving experiment, but we have at least seven large experiments. And then whenever these large experiments can't take beam, we have to slot in others. In order to make optimal use, we have this is a bit like our, our tube map, or like in US, sorry, it's like subway map, where basically you have a particle source in the top. I omitted the unilinear accelerator, but depending on the use case, we route the, the signal to different experimental stations, targets, or even like further accelerators where the beams are being collided. And you can see, for example, one of those schedules in, in yellow. And um, in, in this case, was, if the CIS-100 is not producing beam, we're trying to slot in other use cases. And then once the, the, the yellow cycle needs beam again, we stop and then start another, serving another experiment. And uh, because this is not static, we, uh, many com experiments come and go on a daily day basis. So we have to, to switch between the schedules on a high, highly frequent, uh, high, high frequency. Now, um, in order to have this flexibility, because we have to basically reconfigure our whole facility on a day-to-day -day basis with very different beam parameters, with different use cases. Basically, we have to build every day a new machine for catering the individual experiment requirements. And in order to be flexible and to do that in, let's say, on a 24-7 shift crew basis, you have, we have about four to five uh, operators that are there on 24-7 case. They can't do operating 11 accelerators just by hand. That's sheer impossible. So you have to give them good tools that guide them and aid them to set up this accelerators quick and efficiently and also to help them to diagnose early, uh, failures early on so that they can make informed decisions but also call them the experts to tackle some of the more demanding things and for that we need to create tools so my department our task is basically to do deal with the system integration both vertically but also laterally to combine the different aspects what that make up an accelerator uh, up and that's just like tool and this image is a bit like name of the game if, um, if the hammer is the only tool you have, then all problems are nails. Um, but sometimes you don't know what problems you occur. So what we have to do is basically also prepare for the commissioning of the accelerator a certain set of tools that is flexible enough to, uh, to adjust for the eventualities that you can't foresee. You prepare for a certain extent of variability, but you, uh, you don't have, uh, you can't foresee any problem. Some things you have to diagnose ad hoc, and that's basically the part where GNU-Ray plays a critical role where we said like we have a statically set up environment and flow graph processing uh, for, for the facility, but if there's a problem, we also want to give the domain expert that are not necessarily research software engineers tools at hand so that they can help themselves and make modifications to how the machine behaves without having to become a C++ Java or Python developer. So core of us is always like we provide a service to the experiments that have certain requirements on energy and we basically our deliverable or product is the particle beam with the specific characteristics and for that we need particle accelerators now the big elephant in the room is like what does this have to do with radios or rrf is do we use GNU radio just as a as part of the control system for generic signal processing um actually the uh, dr balana said, said everything about uh, antennas if you accelerate charged particle beams, they emit radio waves. So they have electric magnetic waves that they drag along. And if you want to measure those particles without interfering with them, you just listen what they do while they're traversing uh, one million times around this, this accelerator. And for that, we built, of course, uh, antennas. This is like a strip line or a patch antenna. Looks very much on the slide what you saw earlier, so I don't have to go into details. But we use also micro strip antennas. We call them strip lines. And we have many, many, many other RF designs, like shoeboxes, slotted waveguides, resonant cavities, wall current monitors. We have also magnetic horns. We have also Yagi antennas and direction finders to make sure that we don't leak any of our RF frequencies out into, into the wild, not to make any plane land on our site. And a sort of sort of rite of passage is for, for us that you have to, in one of your career, you have to at least build one of those devices as, as a test, uh, and as a rite of passage that you say like, yes, I'm an accelerator physicist, I built some stuff and I know how this works from, from the ground up. Then, because these are antennas, we have a very common post-processing, like analog front-end chains that come into heterodyne or super-heterodyne uh, post-processing. In, in our case, we place antennas bidirectional, so this is a bit like a phased array. You have like two antennas. You look at the phase differences and the amplitude, and out of that you can derive information like what is the intensity of your carrier? That's basically how many particles do you have in the accelerator? What is the position by the imbalance between one antenna to the next? There we use like typically hybrids. This is still like an analog uh, solution. 
And, but you also get information on the shape of the beam, which is sometimes very crucial because you want to have them compact in a very high brightness, so you want to put as many particles into a small possible, uh, pl uh, plot as possible. And um, as in normal telecommunications, of course, because we have to be flexible, we push a lot of those stack, which was initially very hardware, centered and focused and purpose-built, we want to become more flexible. So many of the things are exchangeable or programmable. And then similar to most radios, like going from the right, the software-defined radio tool chain moves more and more towards the left, where this is then replaced from analog with initially uh, DSP-based systems, but now more and more FPGAs, and leaving the analog part just to the most essential part that you still have to, to treat an analog for conditioning your signals. And yeah, I mentioned about tune. So if the beam oscillates and doesn't have like nice frequencies, it becomes unstable and leaves the beam. So I brought like a more small audio example. Maybe somebody can help me playing that sample. Can somebody click on the top right, please? I brought like a small example. Left two channels. Left, right is like horizontal and vertical motion. And this is basically some of the frequencies are audible. That doesn't sound good. And if, if you agree with me, it doesn't sound good, and it's also not good for the beam. This is like an instability that we have. And this can, can cause massive losses in the accelerator. We have to detect this. On the one hand, you, you heard about like a bit like uh, this ping, ping, ping noise. This is like a kicker. This is a bit like a, we're hitting a tuning fork on the beam and making it resonate deliberately, but by a teeny tiny amount, by just a few nanometers. And then we listen, like, is it still in tune? And in this case, it's reasonable. It still moves. It's not flat. That would be a singleton, but then, uh, yeah, we hit one of the frequency hits a resonance, and then beam becomes unstable, and we have to detect that. So first, we have to track what is the normal oscillation frequencies or modulation, and then if we see every now and then, because of a variety of reasons, we have like transients that can cause this, and we have to capture that and then store it, log it, analyze it, and uh, find mitigations to improve the performance. This is like another example. If you could play on top. Please. Um, here you can see the same thing, but different cycles where you can hear that it's a multiplexing. So we have a repetitive mode where we schedule different beams one after the other. And um, and then you can see like uh, that sometimes things stay the same. But we're looking from one cycle to the next always under differences because they sound similar. A bit like a spaceship or alien. And so, uh, yeah, here the case is that the machine is mostly doing like periodic things where you want to monitor is one execution to the next the same or do you have variations. And uh, for this, um, I took this as an example because we have multi, multi user operation, multi mission, where the same device is not just used for one experiment but by up to 20, 30 different experimental users at the same time that all have different post processing needs for the given application. So they all have the same detector out of which we have sometimes 12, up to 89, or sometimes even 1,001 in, in accelerators. And they use different combinations and different post-processing strategies for the given experiment that we need to provide on, on, a, on a changing basis. On a second scale, we have to, to switch from one mode to the next. And so that's also the part where, uh, where we use GNU Radio to, to make this more flexible, to have like certain common uh, signal processing functionalities available out of the box, but then having this multiplexing concept where you can select, we can quickly reconfigure our SDR based on the individual need. And yeah, the sensitivity, it goes even that down that you can detect single particles. So here you see a Schottky spectrum. This is now uh, around 200 megahertz. Um, so this is basically a higher mode where we look into the shape of, of, of the bunch. You can see like two lines. Um, the two lines are basically two different species of ions that are in injected. And then you can see some small lines that head onto the second line. This is basically when another species is captured and cooled down. So initially it has like a wrong energy and is dragged by the cooling system onto this new trajectory and then uh, is, uh, is operating. And on the right you can see the same uh, thing that you have something on the bottom left. Like a, uh, um, do I have a laser pointer here? No. Probably not. But um, you can imagine like on the left, you have a left, left trace where you goes up and then you have like small branching off into the right trace. This is basically where some of the ions decay. So this is like the first sign of nuclear physics. So you store one isotope beam, 
but then you can monitor the nuclear transformation of one radioactive isotope into another in real time, uh, which normally is very tough because you can't predict when this particle decays, so you have to be ready all the time. And then once you detect this, you have a transient recorder. It's like, please store the last one second before and the next 10 seconds afterwards, because often once you have like one radioactive decay, you have like a cascade of other chain reactions. And this is very important because if you want to understand how the super heavy elements uh, produced, you first have to produce something beyond uranium, and then you look at the decay chains. And the ratio of the decay chains give you information about why we end up with so many heavy elements on Earth like iron and, 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 and others. And there was also like a paper published earlier on. This is a very rare two-body uh, nuclear decay that was, uh, what has been measured with such systems. And this is like a yeah, single particle detection. So in terms of sensitivity, you have, it's quantized. You can't have something that provides less signal than a single particle. Our finger, well, we also do single photon detection. Now the thing is, this is just observation. This is very similar to astronomy and astrophysics. Now the big difference is that we can prepare an experiment. It's not that we just uh, observe randomly occurring effects, but we can also tailor our experiment to be repetitive, to always have basically the exact same, same outcome. And if the energy is not correct, we can say like, okay, we, we tune our reaction so that we can have an optimal use of our detectors to, take, uh, to see this physics that is occurring in, on the target or on the beam. But because of environmental influences, this not, might not always be the perfect conditions. And you have deviations, which is like illustrated here via this deviating beam path. So the important thing is if you measure something, um, you need to know what are the, like a transfer function, you need to know what you put in and what, what comes out. This is just like observa observing. For that reason, we have like lots of um, like eyes and ears, which are diagnostic element from, most of them are electromagnetic nature, but some of them are also optical or also intercepting ionization chambers and looking at, uh, at, at showers. And this is the part where we already used, have been using GNU radio since probably two decades, maybe not advertising as much, but if you're dealing with RF signals, you want to have a flexible prototyping platform, that's where we used uh, GNU radio since, since long because it provides a certain flexibility that you can try out something with students in the university, put it in the lab, trying it out for real, and then uh, deploying it also if it's useful for regular operation. And that's also the part where we got in contact with Derek and Josh, because having a prototype is one thing, but in the end you have to maintain something that runs 24-7 and beyond a, a length or lifetime of a PhD student, so it has to work more than three years. And then long-term maintainability, security, but also other issues become an important issue. But often, some of our di diagnostics is not just a CISO system, like single output, single output, but we have to combine the information of many, many, many detectors across the, the facility. So, um, I am, uh, we, we have to combine them. But, but before that, in that case, would be still very simple. So you, you monitor your state, you compare it with the reference, and then you have a difference. And if you have just a, an open loop system, like you have in radio astronomy, you're, that's it, what you can do. You, so you have to adjust your detectors and hope that it stays stable. But the advantage of, of using a particle accelerator, we can modify this, can look at the difference, and then adjust with, with a powerful set of corrector magnets and RF, additional RF cavities, we can basically modify the beam particles in a way that the deviation from what we actually want to have and that what we measure with those devices vanishes to zero. And that works both in the single input, single output case, but also for the multiple input, multiple output case. And there we use also GNU radio to provide like high level diagnostics and feedback systems where we aggregate the information from, from hundreds of devices, do like a smart post-processing, use also like AI based uh, algorithms that drive basically the, the difference between the reference state and the actual state to, to zero, which is then used to feedback onto the machine. And that is something very special because there comes from us like the requirement that the whole diagnostic part, also the group delay, the feedback path has to be very, short so that you have a stable and fast running feedback system. So we're talking sometimes feedbacks on the time scales of a few seconds, that's very slow. There we use like uh, chunk based data processing, but we also have cases where we have like sample by sample processing where we have feedbacks that are running as fast as with group delays of one or two nanoseconds. And there's like a big gap where now with the new GNU Radio 4.0, we hope that we can maybe achieve something also that covers in the middle for latencies in the order of milliseconds and maybe with the help of FPGAs, maybe also a few 10, 10 microseconds. 
So, yeah, the main thing what our department does is doing system integration, both of the vertical stack, but also the horizontal stack, and providing basically the, the orchestrating the setting supply in order to configure all of these devices. And also we have a very powerful nanosecond timing system, White Rabbit, maybe some of you heard, have heard of it. We work, together with CERN, we are the co-developers of that, and also use it massive, massively to synchronize our SDRs over the facility. And yeah, then we use it for different applications, for monitoring and web type status applications, or also for interactive control and feedback applications, and uh, also for new uh, AI-based research. And our main protocol stack is uh, using OpenCMW, which is zero MQ-based middleware, uh, GNU radio on top, and uh, yeah, AI typically tends to flow on this type of, type of things. Now, these are just some examples where I glance over very quickly. These are some feedback examples for the orbit and trajectory on the left, which is a bit uncontrolled. On the right, you get a flat line. But we also use it for short game monitoring, where we monitor the energy distribution and energy center as a function over long periods of time, and then apply trims to the cavities and magnets in order to bring it back. If you have further detailed question, please ask Alex. That's his baby. He developed this application and also the underlying post-processing framework. Um, or also we control the particle spill rate because we have a means of uh, particles are kept in an RF bucket. This is like a separatrix. And if you start shaking the bucket, then some of the particles spill out of the bucket. And by shaking it properly, you can have a linear spill rate. And uh, in order to get this linear, you have to shape, uh, you, you have to have a very specific form of RF noise that you have to generate. And then you can control this. And this was like a proof of concept on the left where initially I wanted to do a Dirac pulse, like a flat line of Dirac pulse, but I think this was, showing the finger was not something that you could publish. So my colleague said, like, can't you do like a bunny? And so we said, like, okay, let's control the spill rate and make a bunny just because we can. We played the Beethoven's fifth on an accelerator that also works, but normally people want to see something on the right where you get a very smooth, flat rate. And that helps our experiments to have to tune their data acquisition system to always have the same constant input dan beta bandwidth, and then they can write down uh, up to 20 uh, petabytes per year of data. And that's the, the flatter and the more constant beam delivery we have, this is basically worth in gold. 20% performance means that an experiment effectively runs 20% more, and a day of operation at this 18 alone costs about 80 to $90,000. So if you get 20% more performance out, over an operation period of 200 days per year, that's a lot, lot of bang for the buck. And sometimes the feedbacks work quite well. Uh, basically, people don't look at the, the, the actual parameters anymore, but they just look at the feedback actuator signals and then calculate what would be if it wouldn't be, yeah, if you wouldn't switch the feedback offs. And there you can see on the right, like a plot for the actual tunes, they're actually flat, but if you unfold it with the actuator signals, then you can see this is a bit like uh, the electric wire. So if you look on the left, all this, Diagonal lines, as if the beam hits one of those lines, you would lose it instantaneously, and the beam is kept, and then, but we can see what type of resonance we would have had hit if the feedback would have failed. And this is type of the diagnostics that we also derive from our GNU radio integration. Um, and sometimes people don't look actually at the parameter anymore, they just look, is the feedback on? And if not, they call like, oh, your feedback switched off for some safety reasons, could you please switch it back on? And then it's our task to look why, what fails. But people then just look on how much work actuator signals the, uh, the systems had to drive. We have also like a something more, this is a little bit to my heart. Uh, I myself like also by training an analog RF engineer. We have a program which is AI-based non-intrusive load monitoring. This is very fashionable. This is like how to measure the power consumption in a household, in our case industrial scale, where you just have one power meter. But as you all know, if you have switch mode power supplies, they always reflect a certain part of their uh, energy back into the network, and each of the switch mode power supply has a very specific fingerprint. This is known since ages uh, for, uh, as Van Eyck uh, uh, fracking or like Tempest, like here in the US. Uh, this is like a program since the early 70s. And we thought like, we'd, let's put it to good civilian use. So whenever you connect something to our network, we recognize the fingerprint that is reflected on the network. That, by the way, works also here. If, if we mon monitor this here, you would see all the nice notebooks that are connected and see whether they're on, off, or if you go to very high frequencies, you can also reconstruct HDMI signals. But we use it basically to disaggregate and make sure are the devices consuming the power that we, that we anticipate and to make a refactoring. Or if you see that some device is left on, then we can purposely switch off. Um, but also you can s identify malfunctioning or de degrading or inefficient equipment. And this we want to use for uh, scheduling preventative maintenance 
and to and to, to induce like mitigating measures. I mean, we have been using this already on the device level, but the new trick is just to have one single detector per network and then to derive it from a, a, a single location, which is very cost effective rather than having to roll out an instrumentation of 10,000 devices on their own. So this is a bit like a, on what, what we use. We use fairly commodity hardware. And in this case, uh, we have a, a few um, digitizers that go down to DC, but also some, some classical uh, SDRs starting from 100 kilohertz up to 4 gigahertz. And then we package it into this 19-inch rack form um, just because it's better for our rack-based environment. And also we added like a double redundant power supply and HMI board because we're having now more than 200 of those systems that run GNU radio actively. And uh, we're now building up to 500. And when Josh introduced uh, what is GNU radio used for, in terms of usage of nodes where GNU radio is running, you can say like GNU radio is used for controlling particle accelerators with the co-use of mo uh, telecommunication applications. <laughs> Unless uh, I'm joking, I'm joking. But uh, we have a massive investment in, uh, in the usage of, of, of GNU radio because it helps us to, um, to manage a very huge park of different nodes that each have different requirements and to keep yeah, uh, rain over there, bring order to the chaos. Now this is like just a classical deployment of our facility. On the left you can see the power monitoring that we have, uh, a couple of racks, and on the right you have like one of the more denser uh, deployments where we have uh, instrumentation which basically pack, pick a packed full. Um, the reasons we have like this pizza, uh, pizza box format is because these devices are distributed over, over an area, um, over a length of, of a particle beams of four and a half kilometers. And except of those locations, we place them wherever they need because the signal quality is best as close when you're close to the device as possible. So we said like we need a very small format, a small form factor, and very independent, uh, um, independent, um, uh, yeah, a form factor that we can monitor remotely. And because most of the parts are not accessible during regular beam operation. They had to be robust and reliable. That is one of our key requirements because we don't have that many staff to run around and replacing digitizers all the time. So we had to make sure A, the digital, the hardware has to fail, and if it has to fail safe, that's the reason for the HMI board. They, they're designed to have an MTBF of three to 400,000 hours. We can't confirm that yet because we didn't have yet failures. <laughs> But with the number of devices, when we go to 500, this is critical because we can't replace it on a day-by-day -day basis. So we have to accumulate that. We have replaced them scheduled on, on a two-week basis, which is a normal case. It's basically similar to space equipment. Once you put it up into space, then you can't fix it. That's also the reasons why the ESA is coming to GSI in FAIR to test their equipment because they want to make sure whether their equipment survives the solar wind flares and the conditions you have in the outer space. So if we can't break it with our beams, then they say like, okay, we have fingers crossed, it's a high likeliness that they will also survive going to Mars. Okay, this is like our old integration. We have been using GNU Radio 3.7, where basically we have like two types of processing. One is the digitizer handling is done directly by GNU Radio and in the sources and the sample by sample processing. But because some of the signals we have are recurring, are pattern based, we needed also like a chunk-based data processing, so we passed the data on from the GNU radio layer up to like another processing layer, which we used uh, for a long time used a disruptor pattern. And uh, later we also met, uh, played around with RxCPP. This project unfortunately has been abandoned. Uh, and if you look like one of the, yeah, why do we do that? Why do we use GNU radio? It's basically to bridge the gap between like research software engineering and the domain experts. Nick all have the critical role in operating this facility. Not every research software engineer is a domain expert in RF or all the other domains that we have, like cryogenics and magnets and so on. And not every RF expert is necessarily a good research software engineer, but we all have to speak the same language. And uh, using this flow graphs is a good way of communicating the high level intent, what you want to achieve. And by looking at from the top, from the flow graph topology, and also from the bottom, what it entails on the implementation, this is a good common communication factor and organizing the different processing across the whole facility. Now, just to give like a small example, this is one of the fairly simple flow graphs. Uh, I was pleased yesterday to hear, hear that radio has like a complexity estimator. We cheated a bit because ours, if we don't do this simplification, we end up with a couple of 10,000 or a million because these flow graphs have literally thousands of blocks. And then if you think about if you daisy chain lots of blocks, you have a lot of 
interface problems from one block to the next. If you have a long chain of 10, 20 blocks, then you spend more time transferring data into the buffers and out of the buffers than doing actual work for, for the single processing. So that, like most people, I guess, did also in the industry, they use this for prototyping. And when they see, like, we need, like, a real high performance application, then they probably redevelop the chain based on what they prototyped. And we realized we can't do that. We did it for a few blocks, but if you scale this up to 500 systems, that you can't maintain. You don't have enough staff to do that. So we, um, yeah, initially, like most other people, we, so this is just like a so topical view of what is inside. So I'm not going to detail. There are many, many, many different blocks that are basically hidden into one of those larger blocks. And yeah, we, we identified a couple of issues. I mean, like it worked. It was used in, in, in operations, but we, we saw well, we have certain industrial constraints for a large setup. I mean, like we need, we have a certain needs for enhanced safety, reliability, and maintainability. That's an issue with respect to using Python in the field because it's not certifiable from a, a critical infrastructure point of view, which we are. And also the problem is in terms of maintainability, the life cycle of Python is very short. So basically every other year you need to upgrade and modify your code so that it keeps running. We can't stay behind because if we, do, if we don't do this critical security updates, we're hackable and that's, you don't want to read nuclear research facility nearby Darmstadt got hacked, potential leak of radiation is not excluded. You don't want to read this ever in the newspaper, ever. So we have to be careful and have to be safe. And that was a limiting, while Python is very powerful, we have to be able to use, uh, to run this in a pure C++ environment. We use Python still for prototyping, also when people use a lab setup or in the universities, they use Python, and there's the GNU radio flow graph expression in GSC is very powerful and helpful because people can experiment and say, like, oh, that's my flow graph definition. Could you put it in the machine? And then we take the same GRC file, download it into the front end, and then it runs what the people did in the lab or in the, in the university. That's very good. But uh, with the 3.7, there was an absence of compiled and reflection in the central block registry that makes things very hard. And that's the reason why we wrote like this GR flow graph lab. And maybe that was the hook why, because Derek, I guess, randomly Googled and said like, oh, there's some research facility that has some GR. Does it have to do something to do with Green Radio? And he got in contact with us. And yeah, we identified some of the other issues. I'm not going to detail with that. But the game changer was actually yeah, when Derek, we got adopted by the Green Radio community in a sort of way by Derek and, and Josh, because they recognized there's a potential of, of synergies that we could, could collaborate. And uh, especially because uh, Josh and others and other, other architectures uh, team was in the process of developing the new GNU Radio 4.0. The question was like, could we contribute? Could we maybe share our experience and contribute some of our expertise? Because we have, in terms of high performance computing, we have a very strong, um, strong expertise in that domain. Could we contribute some of that to the next GNU Radio to make things more agree agreeable, more easy to use? And then about, about a year ago, we got first invited to a joint GNU Radio architecture working group meeting and discussed our use cases and some of our issues. I mean, prior to that, Josh, I meaning he's a hero, he basically, we, we were struggling with this GR flow graph because we had to do a lot of work around implementations, which basically our work wraparounds were, in, in, it felt more code than the radio core itself. And uh, Josh approached it in a manner like, how hard can that be? And without further ado, two weeks later, he said like, would that work for you? And I apologized that it took him two weeks, which for us was like, like, wow. And we tried it and worked out of the box. And it's like, there's something, let's, let's discuss. And that kicked off the first of many, many, many stones. It was a very, I think until now, seems to be a very, very constructive collaboration, which also on our side was very useful because it attracted a, a lot of very uh, high performance computing and C++ champions. And there we're talking about the one percenters, I like the, the best of the West worldwide. Uh, Matthias Kratz and Ivan Kucic both are senior members of the ISO, uh, ISO C++ Standardization Committee, and they know what, they, what they're talking about when they talk about high performance computing and C++ designs. And they said like, hey, that's an interesting problem. We want to modernize anyway in that area. Maybe we could use and trial some of the concept with this new GNU Radio 4.0 and see whether it also works from a user point of view and maybe polish some rough edges and see that we get the best possible standard out. And yeah, that many enabled many innovations and focus improvements that will also flow back into the ISO C++ standard, likely in the C++ 26, but which is already now available as a library, external library feature. 
And yeah, some of the major technical achievements, we developed a new I.O. buffer and out-of-the-box SMD support, which um, is a, about at least multiple orders of magnitude faster than the existing new Radio 3.x implementation. We uh, also, we, we needed to write this actually to an order our chunk-based data processing because the old new radio buffer only allowed fundamental types, but we wanted to process also accurate types like data sets and vectors. This is now possible and uh, certain modern C++ features allowed a more efficient design and I hope um, a better user experience. The importance I should make, I want to make here and stress out, we want to preserve what is good in GNU Radio. We don't want to break with tradition. We want to make the experience and the use for everybody as smooth as possible and hope that with a pro proposal that we contributed and uh, that we you know, present tomorrow in a bit more detail for review, that this finds uh, interest and maybe where you say like, yes, that's perfect, on, or yes, that's perfect, and could you do this? Or maybe it would be even better if you change this functionality. So I hope for a very lively discussion uh, tomorrow or in the, in, in the aisle. I put up already the slides so you can have a sneak peek to get a bit of a flavor of what we plan to do. Yeah, at FAIR, we're fully committed to, to open hardware and uh, open software. We are signatories of the Public Money Public Code campaign. Please have a look. That's very worthwhile to sign. You can both sign individually as organization and as uh, if you're a government agency, also as a government agency, as we did. And um, based on, since 2002, Q3, we started actively modernizing our stack from Knur Radio 3.7 into 4.0, and where we basically embed now Knur Radio in all, everywhere, from the front ends in the middle tier service that perform the feedbacks, up to our user interfaces, so also top level applications, running on web assembly. So now you can run GNU Radio also on the web, if you like, uh, without having any uh, wrapper or a, a service infrastructure. So it really runs in the browser. Uh, and we aim uh, at a compat full compatibility with the GNU Radio companion. And uh, you yeah, want to further keep strengthening the GNU Radio system, not just because we use it our facility, but also our users use GNU Radio. And we want to make this transaction or tran delivering it from from prototyping into operational use as smooth as possible and as sustainable and as maintainable as possible so that this radio is, is a versatile tool, not just for prototype, but also for industrial use. And we're looking for, for fruitful discussions on these topics. So yeah, we built a lot of tools. Um, like some final new message, never stop learning new things. Learning and knowledge is about it's, it's for each generation has to learn anew, and we have to work and be open for new styles and new things. And uh, I hope that we all stay curious, experiment, don't be afraid to mistake, to make mistakes, because to err is human, and to learn out of this is, is what makes us succeed. And this is all part of a continuous learning improvement process. And yeah, thank you, and looking forward to the radio. I overrun, sorry. <laughs>